as that, whereas the ancient Aristotelians were trying to sort of minimize the value of logic and say, well, it's only an instrument. The Baghdad Aristotelians are trying to maximize the value of logic by saying it's an instrument which is completely indispensable, right? Because they're trying to argue against these grammarians and other critics of the Hellenic intellectual program. So in this debate, Abu Besha supposedly said that logic is one of the instruments by which one knows correct from faulty speech and unsound from sound concept, like a balance, in other words, a scales, with which I may know the more from the less. And that sounds okay, right? I mean, that sounds more or less like what the Alexandrians said. In particular, he's calling it an instrument. But um, one, of the, one of the other things that's ascribed to him by one of the people who doesn't agree with him is that his view is that there is no way to knowledge of the true and false, the right and wrong, or the good and bad, apart from logic, which notice is Elias's remark, right? So you use logic to know what's true and false and good and bad, except that it's a, l a step further in the direction away from mere instrumentality, right? Because on one reading of that, it sounds instrumental, right? so you need logic. So you can't do it without logic. But a, a natural reading of that Arabic would be there's no way to knowledge blah, 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 apart from logic, in other words, except for logic. So logic is the way to do it. And in fact, um, this becomes more and more predominant in the Baghdad school. You find them saying essentially what Ammonius had said about filled in logic. In other words, that logic is the same thing as philosophy. So a, a relatively obscure, even, even obscure for, the, for this, even for this group, he's obscure. Ibn Zura um, says in a short work on logic, it is clear and obvious to anyone who knows about logic or follows what its adherents have said that logic is an art whose goal comprises the sorting out of true from false in speech and the discrimination of good from evil in action. So you might think, boring, I've just heard that two times already. But notice that now the instrumentality has completely dropped out. Right? So its goal is just to do this. And maybe if you pressed him, you, you would say, you mean that its goal is to help philosophy do that, right? And he would say, oh yes, yes, of course, it's only an instrument. But in fact, what he's said is, makes it sound like logic just does everything that philosophy was supposed to do. Um, right, so one of the things that happened because of this, by the way, I should have said that the debate between Abu Bishr and as Sirafi was a huge disaster for Abu Bishr. So he was completely demolished. Um, especially, well, our version of the text seems to come as a report from Asirafi's adherents. So they tell us that Asirafi won. But apparently that is what happened because it stung the Aristotelian philosophers into responding by writing works in which they explain why logic is more important than grammar. And one of the people who did this is this guy Yahya ibn Adi, who is, I, th I think, probably the most important philosopher of the 10th century in Baghdad, if you had asked other people around then at the time. So Al-Farabi is the famous member of the school, but I think at the time Ibn Adi was the most prominent member. And he was a student of Abu Bishr's. So um, he wrote a work on this where he echoes the uh, argument given by Alexander about subject matter and goal on page one. And he says that logic subject matter is expressions insofar as they refer to universal things and logic is the art which, which is concerned with expressions which refer to universal things for the sake of composing those expressions in a way that agrees with the things to which they refer. And again, notice that that makes uh, logic sound pretty close to just philosophy, right? So logic studies universal concepts, shows you how to arrange the concept in order that you will arrange the concepts together in order to have knowledge of the things to which they refer. It doesn't sound like much is being left out for the rest of philosophy to do. So one way of summarizing this view that seems to be threatening to come in, to come in here is that logic would be a sufficient condition for philosophical wisdom, whereas what it was supposed to be in the ancient tradition was a necessary condition. In other words, a mere instrument. Okay, now I want to turn to, uh, I think, a new stage in the debate, 
which we find in Al-Farabi and also Ibn Adi when he's being more careful. And I, I believe this is a position that's not found, at least not explicitly, in the ancient tradition. So Al-Farabi, in uh, one of the works where he's talking about logic, says this. Among the objects of the intellect, there are some things about which the intellect cannot err at all. These are the things man perceives by himself as if he were naturally endowed with knowledge of them and certainty regarding them. For example, that the whole is greater than the part and that every three is an odd number. So these are first principles, right? Or obvious necessary truths. About other things it is possible to err and to deviate from truth to untruth. These are the things which are such as to be grasped with ratiocination and consideration by argument and proof. So regarding these, but not regarding the things known immediately, the man who seeks to arrive at certain truth about what he is inquiring into needs the canons or rules of logic. What is he saying? He's saying there's two kinds of knowledge. There's immediate knowledge, first principles, like maybe the principle of non-contradiction, uh, every three is an odd number, things you don't need to argue for. And then there are the things you do need to argue for, and, if, and when you need to argue for something, you need logic. This is quite reasonable, right? Um, but although it may seem obvious, it actually specifies the sense in which logic might be an instrument in a much sharper way than we've seen so far. Because what he's basically saying is that logic is a, a specific kind of tool. It's the kind of tool that extends knowledge or helps you build knowledge, almost the way that you can build a house if you have a hammer, if someone gives you some wood and some nails. And the wood and the nails are like the first principle, and the hammer is like logic. So it's a tool in a, in a very strict sense. Um, there's a text by Ibn Adi where he explains this in much greater depth, more, more depth than I can actually quote uh, explicitly on the handout, so I've sort of summarized it for you. So what he says is that whatever is known is known either with no need for proof because it is self-evident, or known by means of proof. So these are Farabi's two categories of things known. Things known without proof are either sensible forms or immaterial, in which case they're grasped directly by the intellect. So that's important because it means that whether you're doing physics or other kinds of natural philosophy or whether you're doing metaphysics or mathematics, dealing with immaterial things, there will be some first principles, some things you can immediately grasp without argument. Um, and then he says of the latter, there are simple things known by stipulation and definition. So you can just say, here's what I mean by such and such a term. And there are some things that are immediate premises. And these would be things like Farabi's example, every three is an odd number, the whole is greater than the part. As for that which is known by proof, Knowledge is obtained by resorting to logic from a knowledge of things other than it with a need for prior antecedent knowledge in making it known. This type of knowledge acquisition is called proof, argument, and demonstration. So just to give an example of how this would work, although I guess it's probably clear by now, suppose that I have just immediate knowledge that man is animal because it's part of the definition of man. So I don't need to argue that man is an animal. It's just a first principle. And let's suppose that I have fur a further piece of first principle type knowledge, which is that every animal is mortal. Well, now that's as far as I can get, unless I have logic. Because if I have logic, then I come along with my little scheme, and I say, oh, these two propositions that I know with certainty immediately and without an argument fit this scheme perfectly, right? Because there's a middle term, namely animal. I slot them in, and I get all man is, every man is mortal, because I know that all A is B and all B is C. So it's the scheme that allows me to combine first principles in order to generate new knowledge. And he explicitly connects this to the instrumental status of logic in this passage. The good obtained through logic and apprehended by the intermediary of logic is beyond any parallel since this good is complete happiness. There is no happiness more complete for theory than belief in the truth, and it is through logic that this is apprehended. And in action, no happiness more complete than acquiring the good, without which it cannot be possessed. So that, that's basically the fifth version of this motto we've seen. 
right? So the motto is logic is used to get truth and falsehood in theory on the theoretical side of philosophy and discern good and evil on the practical side. But what he's added here is the idea that logic is this sort of intermediary. It's a bridge from first principles to conclusions. It doesn't give you anything by itself, but when it's combined with the first principles, it gives you all of philosophy, right? So how is this gonna work out in detail? Well, the idea is that every philosophical science has its own first principles. It has its own subject matter, and it has immediate principles that are relevant to that subject matter. They may only be immediate relevant to that particular scientific discipline, but as far as you are, for example, a physicist, then you'll accept that, for example, nature is a principle of motion. You won't have to prove it. So then you take these first principles in your science, and if you, if you, if you didn't have logic, then you'd be stuck, right? But because you do have logic, you know how to combine the first principles to generate the whole rest of the science. So the rest of the science becomes eff effectively kind of corollaries that just fall out of the first principles through a, a really a purely mechanical process of inference. One, uh, one thing that this means, incidentally, although they don't emphasize this, I mean the Baghdad school don't emphasize this, because they're, as I say, they're trying to inflate the importance of logic to argue against these grammarians. It actually turns out that there's quite a few things that we would know without doing any logic. Because anything that we know as a first principle is logic irrelevant, right? Because it doesn't, didn't involve any inference. It's only the things that we derive from the first principles on the basis of syllogistic arguments that we know through logic. And notice also that there's no philosophical logic that is purely, sorry, there's no philosophical knowledge that is purely logical. So they would still be agreeing with the ancient commentators that just knowing that, for example, if A then A does not count as a piece of philosophical knowledge because it hasn't, it's not, it's not a first principle of any philosophical discipline and it doesn't count as an extension of your first principle knowledge.